Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to feel better for life, then do we have the 31 Day Food Revolution show for you. Today I'll be talking with Ocean Robbins, CEO and co-founder of the Food Revolution Network, grandson of the founder of Baskin Robbins, and the author of a phenomenal health-changing book for you and your family, 31 Day Food Revolution. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today about how to heal your body, feel great, and transform your world. That, plus we'll talk about pink spoons, ice cream cone-shaped swimming pools, Jamocha almond fudge, a rebel without a cone, battles over kettle chips, the power of chewing Barbie feet, and why ocean's a much better name than kale. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) <laughs> so welcome to the show, Ocean. Are you ready to shine? I am. Woohoo! <laughs> We're going to have some fun here today. So before we dive right into things, what in the world do ice cream cone-shaped swimming pools have to do with anything? <laughs> well, my grandpa founded a little ice cream company called Baskin Robbins, and my dad, John, grew up with an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of freezer of ice cream in the freezer. Yeah. And you know, he was groomed to one day join in running the family company, but as fate would have it, he ended up following his own rocky road and uh, oh, he left yeah. the path that was practically paved with gold and with ice cream uh, and moved to a little island off the coast of Canada where he built this one room log cabin and joined with my mom and practicing yoga and meditation for several hours a day, and they named their kid Ocean. And as you mentioned, they almost named me Kale, but thankfully, they took pity on my future social life and chose Ocean instead, the more conservative route, I suppose. And uh, But we did eat a lot of kale, and my dad became a best-selling author on food and health over the years with Diet for New America and many other books. So it all started with an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool, and now here we are leading a food revolution. So so he had invented uh, Jamocha almond fudge and brought out pink spoons, but <laughs> he, he, he left Grandpa Irv and was called a rebel without a cone. How did he end up leaving the family business? Because that was, to me, that was massive. That was no small deal. It wasn't a small thing. He had been, he was sweeping the factory when he was six. And as he got a little older, he was given more and more responsibility. My grandpa had a very clear agenda that my dad was going to join him in this company. And it was a thriving company. It was the most successful ice ice cream company in world history. And, uh, but my dad ended up choosing a different path. You know, his uncle, Bert Baskin, the other co-founder of the company, my grandpa's brother-in-law and business partner, uh, had had two heart attacks and was on his way towards dying at the age of 54 from a third. And as my grandpa was considering bringing my dad on as a partner, my dad took a look and said, you know what, uh, an ice cream cone is not going to kill anybody. But he, he decided he didn't want to spend his whole life selling a product that might contribute to more people like his cousins losing their parents too young. And he wanted to contribute to health. And some things he decided are more important than money. So he walked away from the ice cream fortune and, and chose his own path and ended up inspiring other people to take healthier steps in their own lives. And, you know, he inspired millions of people with his books, and one of them ended up being my grandpa. And I think it's kind of fascinating. So let's, let's circle back around because grandpa's health's not doing so well. He's in, the, in with the doc, doc saying, you're on your way out, and I'm not talking about from the office. But... Right. You might stick around a little bit longer if you take a look at this. And what does he hand him? A copy of Diet for New America by the renegade son who walked away from his life's work. (laughs) My grandpa is given this book by his cardiologist, but he wants to live, right? So he reads the freaking book. And this is where it gets amazing. You know, he read the book that the cardiologist gave him, not the signed copy my dad had given him. Um, And he, he followed its advice. So he actually ended up slashing his meat consumption. He ate, he gave up sugar completely, cut way down on processed foods, ate a whole lot more whole plant foods. He gave up ice cream and he got results. My grandpa had been on death's door. He was facing serious yeah. diabetes, heart problems, weight problems. He reversed all that, got off all the medications. He didn't need them anymore. He even improved his golf game by seven strokes and he lived another 19 more healthy years. 
my dad and I were with him on his deathbed in his 90s when it really was his time. And, you know, he said, he said to my dad, he said, when you left Baskin Robbins, I'll be honest with you, I thought you were crazy. And I might have been right, he said. <laughs> and then he said, but thank God some of us have lived long enough to learn a few new things. And then he looked at both of us and he said, I'm so proud of you because you're helping people. Now, I'm proud of my grandpa for his business achievements. He was an extraordinary entrepreneur, one of the most successful in US history. But I'm even more proud of him for having the courage to open his mind and make a change. He was one stubborn cookie. And if he could make a change, could give up ice cream for goodness sakes, because he wanted to live, I think there's hope for the rest of us as well. I think of my parents who I'll be visiting down in Florida in a couple of weeks. And as, as I'm reading this beautiful book, I'm going, but we should all know this stuff. This is common knowledge. It's out there. But then I think of my parents and I go, wait a second. <laughs> it isn't so common knowledge. It isn't out there. And maybe if he could switch, then maybe my parents could switch. Now, I want to take a snapshot, kind of a snapshot of me visiting my family, a snapshot of you running with your dad in Rancho Mirage, California. And who are you running past walking maybe at a brisk pace? And that would be my grandpa. So, you know, after his health transformation, he started going for morning walks every day for like a good hour, hour and a half with his with his dog. And uh, my my dad and I were visiting. We were marathon runners at the time. And uh, one morning we're out running our morning uh, hot run and my grandpa's out doing his morning hike and we jog on past him and smile and wave and he's cheering us on. And I'm thinking to myself, this is what healthy food can do in every generation. It can fuel a vibrant, healthy life. And that's what I want for everybody. Woohoo! So <laughs> tell us about, see if I get this right, Tashka Yawanawa and yeah. how he influenced you. So Tashka was a chief of the Yawanawa tribe in the Brazilian Amazon. This is a tribe way out there in the tropical rainforest. To get to their village, you have to take multiple flights and then a private plane, and then you have to like trek through the forest. It's quite a journey. Um, and his people have lived in harmony with nature sustainably for countless millennia, but their homeland is threatened today because of logging. And guess what? They're cutting down the trees and burning them to create grazing land for cattle and for oil drilling and to create land on which to grow soybeans. Guess who's eating the soybeans? Cattle. So, um, you know, if you really want to look at whose hands are on the chainsaw, at the end of the day, it's those of us who eat rainforest beef and who eat meat that's from animals that were raised in feedlots and fed soy from down there. So uh, anyway, Tashka and ended up having to leave his tribe. Mm -hmm. Uh, part-time so he could communicate with the modern world. He reached out. I ended up meeting him. I was directing a nonprofit at the time, working with leaders all over the world. And he said, we need help to preserve our rainforest. We own this land legally in the state of, in the nation of Brazil, but uh, we can't enforce it because we don't have any way to track what's happening on the, the rainforest land. And our, the survival of our people is threatened. So we ended up helping raise the money so his people could buy a plane. And they would fly over the rainforest, and any time wow. there was encroachment on their territorial lands, they would report it. And they also got a, sa a satellite phone, so they could communicate with solar panels. <laughs> they could communicate so cool. from the middle of the jungle, and they could say, hey, there's somebody doing something. And they could report it, and they developed the connections in government, and they were help able to help preserve their homeland and their way of life for future generations. Thank goodness. And Tashka showed me both the power of working together across divides because we could do fundraising he could never dream of because mm -hmm. we have connections in the U.S., right? And he could do things we could never dream of. If I wanted to save the rainforest, what the heck can I do? But working with him, we could collaborate and do a lot. But he also showed me that we ultimately, we as consumers have tremendous power because if we uh, choose to eat less burgers, we help to save not just tropical rainforests, but forests all over the world. It, the reality is that meat consumption is one of the single largest driving forces behind the destruction of forests worldwide, one of the single largest drivers behind climate change, and single users, greatest users of water on the planet. Well, when we choose to eat less meat or, or no meat, we say no to all of that, and we say yes to a healthier future for our kids and grandkids. So I'm going to double back around with that. But since, since you brought up a few interesting points, I'll go there first. Then, then we'll double back around. First off, it's not just water consumption. It is literally changing 
the where it rains, how it rains, what's going on with soil, the works. What can you tell us about this? Well, climate change is one of the great threats to our way of life, and it's it's alarming and it's progressing rapidly. And it's causing droughts in some places and floods in others, and it's causing unpredictable weather patterns. And it's, you know, people think of global warming and they think, oh, it's going to be a couple degrees warmer. And for a lot of us, that doesn't sound so bad, especially in cold winters. But it's not just that. It's destabilizing and throwing everything out of whack. And, uh, you know, the, the planet is very finely tuned. And when you throw things off, you get all kinds of unpredictable impacts. Right now on this planet, there are about 2 billion people who are dependent for their water or their food on aquifers. This means that there isn't enough water from rainfall to necessarily provide for their needs. So they're pumping it from underground. Aquifers are deep rivers, lakes, bodies of water under the earth. They've been stored up over countless, countless millennia. But we are draining them much faster than they're replenishing. And there are billions of people who, when those aquifers want, run dry, may not have water to drink, water to flush their toilets, or even water to grow their food. This is an alarming trend, and we need to do something about it. And the reality is that climate change is making it worse, because in places like California, where I live, if we uh, become more desertified, if we don't get consistent water, if we have droughts, we become more dependent on those aquifers, which means we pump them faster. And guess what happens if we run out? Then we suddenly have to live within our water means, which could have a major impact on our food supply. What's the link between food and water? According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, it takes about 2,000 gallons of water to produce one pound of feedlot beef. That's an, enough. You could stack a pile of gallon jars almost half a mile high just to produce one pound of beef. That's a heck of a lot of water. It takes um, you know, enough water to go into a, a full-size steer that you could float a naval destroyer. So all that water is having an enormous impact. By the way, where is that water going? It's not because cows are so thirsty. I mean, yeah, they do drink, but that's not where most of it's going. But because it takes about 12 pounds of grain or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef, we're irrigating that land, or we're irrigating pasture land, at the, and the cattle are eating that. Either way, a lot of water is going into our food supply through beef, the beef industry. Now, chicken, pork, those are not as wasteful, but they're still wasteful because it takes maybe five pounds of grain or soy to produce one pound of flesh from them in factory farming systems. The rest of that is all getting turned into hoof and hide and bones and manure and energy the animals expend as body heat and to move around and to live. And even though the industry tries to keep them immobile in these factory farms, they can't help it. The animals are still living creatures. We basically have created protein factories in reverse. And we are turning our precious water, our precious topsoil, our precious natural resources, our precious forest land into essentially waste with a little bit of meat on the side. How much water then? And then, and then we're, we're inclusive here. We're going to take everybody in and help everybody on a healthy journey, no matter what you eat. But how much water does it take for a pound of kale? Well, it, it takes around 100 gallons or so, a lot less than, you know, the 2,000 that it might take with the beef, you know. Um, every food has its quotient, but the bottom line is that the vast majority is going to animal agriculture. In the state of California, where I live, um, you know, we use uh, more water for livestock than we do for all municipal uses, all the swimming pools and toilets and drinking water and golf courses and all business and government uses combined just for animal agriculture. And we import most of our meat in the state of California. So let's go from there. Let's take one more. Let's going to switch it to a positive. Then we're going to dive into some, uh, some other major changes or things that we can do, even minor things that we can do that make a big difference. But tell us about the success with the Detroit Community Garden Movement. I am so inspired by community gardens. I mean, they get kids involved. Studies show us that when kids grow vegetables, they're more likely to eat vegetables. In fact, one of the best ways to encourage kids to eat vegetables more is to get them growing them. Um, but community gardens are also responding to multiple problems. Detroit is a city where, you know, 10 years ago, the average median uh, home sale price in Detroit was under $20,000. It was economically devastated. 
And um, there were a lot of vacant lots because people just simply couldn't sell their homes and things were getting ripped apart and a tremendous unemployment rate in the city of Detroit. And people responded to that because there were two things that they had that were resources now. They had time on their hands for people who were unemployed and they had vacant lots. So people responded to that in many cases by growing food. They started community gardens and Detroit became the community gardening capital of the United States. There are over 1,000 community gardens in the city's city limits. People are growing tomatoes and broccoli and kale and cabbage and all sorts of vegetables. And uh, they're helping feed populations of people who need it most. I think this is one of these inspirational stories where sometimes people respond like an immune system in a time of illness. We respond creatively and brilliantly to challenge. And the people of Detroit have inspired me so much. I, I love it. And when you think about those things, if you walked into my kitchen's last living room, you would find tomato plant vines over 10 feet high and kale and spinach growing in our kitchen. <laughs> so let's, let's go from there. Let's talk about detoxifying. And you have two, I hope it's a good way to put it, special sons, River and Bodhi. And yeah. uh, I believe it was when Bodhi was nine, um, and I guess he was the elder by six minutes, or still is the elder by six minutes. You were butting head over butting heads over kettle chips. <laughs> yes, we were. So, uh, so yeah, we have a special twins, River and Bodie. By the way, River is uh, the naming came because, of course, the ocean refuses no river. Uh -huh. uh, Bodhi's name actually came to me in a dream. Uh, his full name is Bodhi Sattva. Uh, I just had this inspiration that he was here to truly uh, be of service in this world, and indeed he is. Uh, but when he was nine, uh, he and I were having a lot of conflict over potato chips. He would grab a bag, and you know I would tear it away from him, and I'd hand him five, and he'd jump in and grab ten. And you know um, sometimes I would hide the potato chips in various odd places, and he would scour the house. One day he found a bag under my bed and ran off and with the loot and hid himself in his room with the door locked until he had devoured the entire bag. Um, and so we had a lot of conflict and we, uh, the potato chips were sold on aisle four at our local grocery store. And, uh, you know, every shopping trip would start with it, him demanding that we go to aisle four first, and then he would grab a bag of chips and eat them in the store. And, uh, you know, if I didn't let him do that, then all cooperation would go out the window and more than once or twice, there were some bad scenes in that store with some very annoyed customers looking at us very angrily. Um, but uh, one day I went to my wife and I said, what do you think we should do? Like we're having all these conflicts over potato chips. And she said, I think you should stop buying potato chips. <laughs> and I looked at her and I was like, wait a minute, that means I'd have to stop eating potato chips. She was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and then I realized, of course, that she was right. We can't we can't uh, preach one thing into another, especially with our kids. Yeah. So, um, so I stopped buying potato chips, and lo and behold, we stopped having fights over potato chips. It was amazing. We even stopped having conflicts when we went shopping because he got over it really fast. And that was my first cl clue to the lesson that if you really want to change what you eat, one of the first things to do is to change what you buy. When you aren't surrounded by certain influences, you're much less likely to be pulled in those directions that you don't want to go. Very cool. I, I like um, whole wheat tortillas. And um, I know that there's a, there's a little bit of flour I can have, whole wheat, multi-grain that's not bad. At a certain point, it's not good for me. And I've recent ta recently taken to keeping them in the freezer because that additional step of having to get them into my mouth slows down their consumption. From here, yeah. l l let's go. Yeah. Let's talk about former New York Senator Eric Adams and Dr. Michael Greger, who we've had on several times, we absolutely love him and how not to die. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so um, so uh, New York, um, he's this, um, Eric Adams is uh, is a borough president in the city of New York, and he was facing he he was practically on death's door. He was facing serious uh, diabetes and many other health problems, and. Um, he uh, had the good grace to read How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger, and he put it into action, and he feels that the whole foods, plant-based diet he adopted as a result saved his life, but he's in a fairly influential position, so he decided to put what he learned and what he experienced from his own personal life into action. So he's now um, pushing for um, th that every hospital in New York, ha in the city, in the borough he's in, has to have um, a nutrition department 
wow. where they teach people about healthy food. And all the events that are held in City Hall um, have to have plant-based options um, if you're going to do an event there. And uh, he's still looking for creative ways to use his political office to further the, this message because he knows what's at stake. It's the lives of our children and our families and indeed our planet that are on the line. Thank you. So I'm thinking, and Michael Pollan here, which is what really what you're talking about, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I'm yeah. hearing my mom in the background going, where do you get your protein? Michael, you're not getting enough protein. Right? <laughs> we do hear that, don't we? So here's the deal. I mean, protein is very important. I mean, you know, it's one of the essential building blocks for life and for your body, and we all do need it. And it's comprised of a bunch of a different amino acids. And some people are worried, by the way, about getting the right mix. And they say, oh, only, you know, egg is a complete protein because it's got all of them. Well, you know what? There's, there's amino acids in every which thing. And as long as you eat a basically balanced diet, you're going to get all the different ones. So you don't need to worry about one particular food source. There's no uh, superiority to animal products over plant foods when it comes to the amino acid composition. Um, you really just can think about protein overall as a macronutrient. And we need protein, we need carbohydrates, and we need fat to live, right? And um, but a lot of people are worried about getting enough protein, and it turns out a lot of people are getting too much protein. In fact, the average American gets roughly twice as much protein as they actually need. Mm. And Dr. Belter Longo at University of Southern California conducted some fascinating studies out of which uh, he came to the conclusion that too much protein is killing far more people than too little protein. And in fact, what he said was that a high protein diet is more uh, dangerous from a life expectancy perspective than smoking is. In other words, eating too much protein is more dangerous than the cigarette habit. 15 cigarettes a day, he said. So, um, you know, that's a remarkable piece of data. And uh, he's not advocating getting too little protein, he's advocating getting the right amount of protein. But the reality is most of us are getting too much. So, um, so what's the right amount? Well, it varies depending on your life stage, how physically active you are, and other factors. But generally, for most people, it's going to be 60 or 80 grams per day. The average American is getting, you know, 120 or more. And um, so, you know, there are many different sources of protein. You do want to get enough. I think legumes are one of the best. They provide about 30% of the world's protein overall. And they also come packed with fiber and a lot of wonderful vitamins and minerals. And their net impact on the planet is uh, minuscule compared to beef, for example. I think it was Dr. Michael Greger. It may have been uh, uh, Dr. McDougall, but I think it was Michael Greger who was talking about legumes and, and beans in particular as being the soil on which probiotics root into. And so you can take probiotics, 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 but if you're not getting the legumes in you, a lot of them just go through the system versus you can redevelop your flora with the legumes. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. You can. You know, uh, speaking of flora yes. and the gut, I mean, everyone's talking about the gut. It's kind of the new tofu, if you, if you think about that. We're all hearing about it all the time. Gut health, microbiome, microbiome, you know. Um, so it's really important. I think it's one of the maybe the most compelling frontier of new understandings in science of human health and food. And um, what we're learning is that there are all kinds of critters. There are 40 trillion chemists in your body right now that are all hard at work and they're digesting your food and they're producing the neurotransmitters that make your brain happy. And they do all kinds of critical functions that make your body work, work and work properly. And we have good guys and bad guys, to put it very simply. The bad guys are the ones that like sugar and processed junk and they actually will crave it. So if you feed them, then if you eat more sugar and processed junk, they have more to eat and they'll want more. And if you ever feel a craving in your stomach for donuts or candy or some kind of junk food, it's probably those bacteria in there that are saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, right? But you've also got your good guys. And you know what they like to eat? They like to eat fiber. We call it prebiotics. This is the food for the good bacteria. These are the ones that produce the neurotransmitters that you want. These are the ones that produce, um, that, that digest your food optimally. And fiber is bacteria food. We think of it as something that keeps us regular. It does that too. But less than 5% of the U.S. population is getting the recommended daily allowance for fiber. In the U.S., that's set at 30 grams per day. The average American gets about 15. 
our Paleolithic ancestors, we believe, got on average in many parts of the world 100 or more. So what's optimal? Probably quite a bit more than 30, but the average American's getting 15. You don't have to be part of that statistic. And you can step forward and say, yes, I want to feed the good guys and I want to have a thriving microbiome. And the best place to start is with plenty of fiber. Now, let me be very clear here yes. where fiber is and where it is not. Well, because I'm, I'm, no hearing, I'm hearing mom here. Mom's okay. wanting to come out of me again. And she's wanting to grab a box of cereal or this processed food or that processed food, which is labeled with X grams of fiber. So isn't this healthy for me? Right. Okay. Well, so I'll get to that in a second. All right. So first of all, when it comes to fiber, there's none in any animal products. Mm -hmm. There's none in any bottled oils. There's very little in white flour or white sugar. And there's a lot of fiber in whole plant foods. Now, when you look at packages, yes. um, there are a lot of health claims made on packages. And you've got to look at those with a lot of suspicion because honestly, most food that's packaged is probably processed. It probably came more from a factory plant than from a plant that grew in the ground. And we need to eat more foods in their natural, unprocessed state. Mother Nature is brilliant. And nature has created an incredible symphony of compounds that all work together in exquisite harmony to help you thrive. You know, if you take a trumpet and you play it all by itself, it might sound okay if you've got a good trumpet player, but it'll sound a lot better as part of a fabulous band generally. And foods are kind of like that. And so what we do in our processed food industry is we take various compounds, components, chemicals, elements out, separate them and repackage them in ways that make companies money. But unfortunately, they are not optimal for your health in most cases. So um, we want to eat more whole plant foods. And so packages with fancy claims on them, usually there's something to look suspiciously at. We've got all these packages that say low fat, low fat. And usually what it means is high sugar. Or then we got low carb, and usually what it means is high fat. So, you know, that, and neither of those is a panacea for optimal health. And when they say, oh, five grams of fiber, well, that's great. It probably means there's some whole grain in there. That's very nice. That's good. We should eat more whole grains. But look with suspicion because you got to see what else is in there because that doesn't mean it's a health food. Thank you. Thank you. So in chapter three, you have foods to eat, foods to avoid. I want to yeah. talk about a few of your favorite foods to eat. Before I do that, two popped up that we have in the house right now. One my, my wife absolutely loves. And the second was on a, a raw garlic spread that we bought this week. And I was like, hmm, I wonder about this. So the first is my wife loves organic free range or pasture range. Uh, um, what do we call it? Um, not sustainable with the word for taking care of an animal. Well, it comes up later uh, on, uh, humane? uh, humanely raised ghee. And the other yeah. is safflower oil and okay. raw safflower oil. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What can you so, tell us? Um, all right. What I can tell you, um, so, you know, if you're going to eat animal products, then absolutely. It's a huge improvement if they're fed organic feed if they get to see the sun and grass and be outside and stretch their legs instead of being cooped up in horrendous conditions. So pasture raised, grass fed, these terms have meaning and value. Free range has minimal value, by the way, because you know the average chicken in industrial operations gets one square foot per bird. In free range, they get two and a half square feet per bird. It's a step in the right direction, but Pasture-raised chickens, on the other hand, get 108 square feet per bird. So that's kind of the real deal, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so anyway, back to your back to ghee. That's that's basically butter. It's clarified butter, but essentially it's still butter. It's just got some things removed to make it a little bit more pure. So it's pure fat, essentially. Um, and it's coming, hopefully, from animals that were treated uh, decently. And, um, you know, I think that's a big step in the right direction. Um, there are some downsides to it, such as that, uh, their babies were probably still taken away at birth. The mama cows uh, cry and cry for their babies and miss them a whole lot. And they're often um, have been bred to have massive udders and produce milk all the time, right? Which is what we want from them. They are milk cows after all. And they're kind of treated a little bit like four-legged milk pumps. But if they do get to be outside and see the sun and their milk's going to be healthier and they're going to be happier and they're not going to be contaminated with hormones or antibiotics, and that's a good thing. That said, they still have their own natural hormones. They are a lactating mammal. And uh, you could see that as Americans started drinking more and more milk, particularly industrialized milk, uh, average age of first menstruation amongst girls dropped from 16 to 12, 
We don't know if it's directly um, caused by that, but it certainly could be a factor. And, um, and there's also been a significant rise in breast cancer rates during that time. And so it's very possible that a lot of the female cancers and female reproductive challenges could be impacted negatively by milk consumption. Thank you. And then safflower oil. Okay. So safflower oil is really no health food. I'm, I'm sorry to say it um, for all the safflower lovers out there. And I hope that I'm not sued by the Safflower Oil Association of America for saying this, but it is a high omega-6 fatty acid oil. It's a processed food. All oils are essentially processed. You take a whole food and you separate it out. And you get just the fat, but you're losing all the fiber and all kinds of vitamins and antioxidants that were in the original product. As oils go, safflower is probably um, one of the least healthy. I mean, I think soy oil and corn oil uh, and co certainly cottonseed oil are worse, but um, it's very high in omega-6 fatty acids. And most of us get way too many omega-6s and way too little omega-3s. Mm -hmm. And just quick primer on omega-3 fatty acids for those who uh, are not familiar with this. So there's ALA, EPA, and DHA. They're all omega-3 fatty acids. ALA is uh, the most common one. It's in plant foods. It's in especially chia seeds and flax seeds. Your body converts it into EPA and DHA, which are critical. They're called the long chain fatty acids, and those are essential for brain health. Uh, the only dietary sources of EPA and DHA are algae and fish. The fish get it from algae. And so certain high fat fish provide it. Most people don't like to eat a whole lot of algae. So you can, you can get uh, supplements if, you, if you're vegan and you want plenty of EPA and DHA that are made from algae. Um, but your body also converts ALA into them. And so a lot of people do just fine if they eat plenty of chia seeds or flax seeds or other ALA sources. But here's the interesting thing. When you have a lot of omega-6 fatty acids, it actually reduces your body's ability to efficiently convert the omega-3s. So, uh, so it makes it more likely, likely that you will be deficient in EPA and DHA. And a lot of uh, omega-6s can also lead to excess inflammation in the body and even potentially to higher risk for heart disease. So in general, you want to reduce your omega-6 consumption. And uh, corn oil, soy oil, and safflower oil are all very high in omega-6 fatty acids and very low in omega-3s. What about when we go, you can even go to your local um, organic grocer, and I won't name names here, and go to their, their um, I don't know what do you call it, uh, food buffet thing. And yeah. you'll find many, many health foods with cooked in canola oil. Sure. Well, canola oil, uh, a lot of it is genetically engineered because unless it specifically states otherwise, it's coming from canola. And about 90% of our rapeseed, which is what we make canola oil out of, is genetically engineered, which means that it was sprayed with Roundup, glyphosate, or other herbicides. And um, these, are, these weed killers were, were never designed to be sprayed on food eaten by humans. And their glyphosate, for example, is a probable carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization. It's a known endocrine disruptor, and it's been patented as an antibiotic. So it can disrupt the bacterial milieu in your digestive tract. So uh, it's not your friend, I don't think. And I try to avoid GMOs, and canola oil is one of the big ones. Um, if you're using organic canola oil or non-GMO canola oil, then uh, you still have to look at that omega-3, omega-6 balance. And I think it's got about three times as much omega-6s as omega-3s, which is better than corn, soy, and um, you know, safflower oil, which may be like more like 10 or 100 to 1. But, uh, but it's, so it's got a bit of omega-3s, but, but still not a great balance. Um, the, the best oils from that perspective are going to be flax oil, yeah. uh, something called camelina oil, or even hemp oil has a little bit more of the omega-3s. And then coconut oil and olive oil have neither omega-6 or omega-3, and so they have a whole other um, nutritional profile. Great. I, I didn't expect to spend so much time on the oils, but I'm going to ask one more oil question, which is how much do you look at the, um, the I don't know if I call it the burn temperature, the, uh, the temperature at which the oil breaks down? Uh, well, it's a factor to look at. Every oil has its smoke point. Thank and, you. you know, if you're cooking with oil, then you want to be careful about that um, because uh, Heating oils too high can release free radicals, which are, can be carcinogenic, and lead to a whole host of 
negative health outcomes. Um, in general, you do not want to cook too much with oil. Uh, oils don't do well with that, and you want to go for the more unrefined and cold press types if you're going to use oil. Um, but uh, if you are cooking with it, don't go super high heat. Deep frying is really not your friend, and it's not good for your body. But even stir frying, you know, it's nice to add some water in there, not make the oil the entire liquid source that you're using in most cases. You know, sure, if you want to stir fry some onions to get a nice saute going, fine, go for that. But, um, but in general, I, I try to minimize it. And I would say, um, you know, the most stable oils are probably going to be coconut oil, not because it can go super high, because it's stable up to its smoke point. And if it's smoking, you'll know it because you get some bad smells and the yeah. smoke alarm goes off. That's not a good sign. Thank you. So let's talk about a few of your favorite foods that you'd recommend for people. All right. One of my favorites is greens. Mm -hmm. Rush, uh, Rush University researchers, researchers in Chicago uh, looked at, um, they studied um, 81 plus year old folks, 950 of them for quite some period of time. And they looked at all different diet and lifestyle factors. And they ended up concluding that the people who ate the most greens had 11 more years of healthy brain function. 11 years. Now, just, just to touch on that, I mean, my grandma died of Alzheimer's. And at the end of her life, she couldn't even remember my name. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, I wish that she could be around even now to see what her grand, great grandkids have turned into and to know about the work that I'm doing and to be proud of me, you know, but we don't get that chance because she's gone. And I think about uh, how many people are suffering from this dreaded disease and what our families would give to get 11 more years of their brains back for anybody who's suffering. And we could get that just with greens. Another one is blueberries, which are also extraordinary. And they also are linked to a two-year bonus in healthy brain function, interestingly enough. Um, so blueberries and greens are good, not just for your brain, but also for your heart, for every cell. They help fight cancer. Remarkable, remarkable statistics on this. Mushrooms are another one. Uh, researchers studied 2,000 women, half of whom had had breast cancer, half of whom had not. Perth University in Western Australia. They uh, found that those women who consumed about a third of an ounce of mushrooms per day, the equivalent of like one button mushroom a day, had a 64% drop in their odds of dying of breast cancer. 64% just from mushrooms. When those same women also drank green tea mm -hmm. regularly, their risk of breast cancer dropped by 89%. Now, can you imagine, Michael, what would happen if there was some new super drug that came out that could drop breast cancer by 89%? I mean, we'd be going crazy over it. It would probably be added to the drinking water, for goodness sakes. But here we are with our greens and our mushrooms and, you know, our green tea, and we're learning that these are real superfoods that can really transform our lives. And I'll tell you what, if, if I think that if uh, doctors got, got um, reimbursed for prescribing mushrooms, like they get reimbursed for chemo drugs, we would see a lot more mushrooms eaten, and we would see a lot less people dying of cancer. So I think it's time, fortunately, that none of us need to wait for doctors to put this uh, into action. We can put it into action in our own lives right here and right now. So since I heard about that, yeah. even though I'm not probably at super high risk for breast cancer, I've been eating my mushrooms, I've been drinking my green tea, and there are so many other wonderful superfoods as well. Spices, turmeric, black pepper, garlic, red pepper, like cayenne pepper, amazing health benefits. I mean, these are superfoods because they can keep you super healthy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And another one that's, that's sometimes on my list and I go through periods where I'm having it first thing in the morning is juice and then sometimes it's way off my list, but it'll be back on after this book, celery. <laughs> celery, who would have thought it? I thought, I always thought celery was, you know, just a bunch of water with some string attached to it, you know? <laughs> Well, but it turns out that celery has some remarkable compounds in it that help fight cancer. And it's, uh, it's extraordinarily effective in that pursuit. It's remarkable. Uh, I, I'm just thrilled. So uh, celery is amazing for you. I super recommend it. You can juice it. You can also do ants on a log. This is my kid's favorite. You smear some peanut butter on the inside, dabble it with a few raisins down the middle, and then you got an incredible delicious snack. Very, very cool. So I'm going to bring us around from there. I'm going to take us, I, I, all of this stuff to me sounds like common sense, but it may be that I've just read book after book after book after this. But I, I ended up years ago throwing out all our pots and pans and going for some new stuff. 
Tell yeah. us why nonstick doesn't mean toxic and what we do want. Okay. So there, some of the toxins that get into your body don't just come from food. And um, that's why I have a whole chapter in 31 Day Food Revolution that looks at the secret sources of toxins that might be getting into your body that you want to keep at bay. And one of those comes from nonstick pans, like Teflon pans and so forth. Some of these nonstick coatings degrade. They, they, the manufacturers reassure us that they only degrade when they're heated too much. Well, guess what you do with pans? You heat them. <laughs> Studies have found that the average American heats their pan well beyond the level that is considered problematic for these compounds. Some of them actually have uh, warnings on them saying that if you have birds in the house, don't use this pan beyond medium temperature or make sure the windows are open. You may have heard of the canary in the coal mine. That's usually birds me. Will... <laughs> yeah, right? Birds can die uh, early. And that's sometimes a warning for coal miners. Well, it doesn't take any coal miner to realize that if it's bad for birds in the house, it's probably not good for you or me either. Yeah. So uh, these pans are problematic. They do release toxins, and you don't have to buy it. So what I recommend is there are, there are a number of uh, new materials you can use that are also nonstick, but that don't have those hazards. You can get... Um, it's called ceramic coated cast iron. It's much lighter than regular cast iron, but it's like got a layer of cast iron and then a layer of the ceramic coating that's nonstick, but it's actually a, originally a clay material, essentially, the ceramic is, but it even works on induction stoves. Mm -hmm. And then there is cast iron and then there's also stainless steel, but that does tend to stick quite a bit. And then there are, um, there are, there are some other uh, green earth from Ozeri. It's a German company. They make a pan that is um, you know, relatively safe and non-toxic and inert and super green certified. Very so these cool. are some of the options. And I also uh, think while we're on the topic that plastic food storage containers are Thank a pretty you. serious, serious problem and plastic water bottles as well. Um, these plastics, whether they're BPA free or not, they leach chemicals into our food, into our water that can be carcinogenic, that can mess up your hormonal balance that are even associated with higher rates of type two diabetes and heart disease, amazingly enough. And uh, so we, when I learned about this stuff, we quickly got rid of all of our plastic food storage containers. We now have glass with plastic snap on lids. I don't mind plastic being on top. It gets a little condensation, but it's not like sitting against the food all day long. And then when I'm on the go, I use a stainless steel food storage container with a snap on uh, lid that has a silicone seal gasket and that that seals things up nicely and works very well for me And it really wasn't that hard and I use a stainless steel, you know water bottle when I'm traveling in, in out in the world and uh, You know it works for me you, you can find what works for you But the bottom line is get the plastics and the non sticks out so you can bring the health in Have you actually have you heard of the one that we're using? I'm, I'm curious if you've heard of it's greenware from the Netherlands. It has a uh -huh. ceramic coating on it Nice. Yeah Sounds great. I haven't used that one, but there are so many good options out there and you can find what's in your budget and you know what works best for your lifestyle. Very cool. So I'm going to ask about it. This, I'm doing a lot of me search here today. And so one of the things that I have, because I'm on the go with this show quite frequently, I have to make food quickly. That's my, yeah. that's my excuse is I use BPA free cans, but I still know, I know there's probably a lot more in there, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, cans are not really um, good for you. But I also recognize we live in the real world, and it matters more what's in the can mm -hmm. than the can itself. Um, so, you know, we don't want to make the perfect into the enemy of the good, okay. you know. And so, I, you know, hold yourself with compassion. If you do the right thing most of the time and do the best you can, you're going to eliminate a lot of the problems, and you just work with what you got. That's one of the core messages in 31 Day Food Revolution is, Hold yourself with compassion and recognize that, you know, um, this isn't about trying to win a purity contest. No one's sending the food police in to inspect your home. This is about doing the best you can with what you got and making progress and moving forward. And so, yeah, maybe you want to get rid of the cans if you can, and no pun intended, and, and find some other alternatives. There are some manufacturers that are putting stuff in glass now, but we all know glass is heavy and breakable and has its downsides as well. So, you know, you work with what you got, um, you know, and some people wonder, is it better to eat fresh or frozen? And actually one piece of good news here, obviously you can't take frozen food on the road too easily unless you live in a very cold place, but, but, um, you know, frozen foods actually preserve nutrients quite well. So if you're looking at frozen fruit or frozen vegetables, they're pretty good. They were probably picked at the peak of harvest. 
frozen very quickly, and they actually are, can be very good for you. Very, very cool. So since you were talking about the food police, I want to cover two key topics here. First off, what do we need to look for in our breakfast? Breakfast. Ooh, good one. All right, so I've got a problem with breakfast. It's yeah. not really the meal itself. It's what most of us do with breakfast. You know, we tend to, for breakfast, most people have very little vegetables, almost none. Usually breakfast is some combination of bacon, eggs, or other animal products mixed with white flour products like white flour pancakes, waffles, you know, whatever, bread, toast, and some kind of uh, sugar or sweetening source, whether we're talking jam or, you know, high fructose corn syrup masquerading as maple syrup or, you know, some such thing. And um, it, there's no rule that says that breakfast needs to be, you know, those kinds of things. So uh, there are healthy alternatives like, you know, whole grain flour products and things you can make with, you know, healthier pancakes or waffles if you want. Oatmeal is a wonderful one. Mm -hmm. Or chia, a chia soak. We make this amazing chia pudding where I, I soak chia seeds overnight in some unsweetened soy milk or nut milk or coconut milk and uh, add some vanilla, some frozen blueberries that I mix in there, some banana chopped up, uh, maybe a little nutmeg or allspice for extra seasoning. Stir it all up. I might add a dash of maple syrup. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next morning, I have this amazing, delicious pudding porridge ready to go for breakfast. It's fabulous. Packed with omega-3s and phytonutrients and, and antioxidants and fiber and protein. It's pretty awesome. So that's one of my favorites. You can also, Oatmeal is wonderful with some nuts and seeds, maybe some ground flax mixed in. Uh, or here's another alternative for breakfast, leftovers. Mm -hmm. Might sound crazy, but sometimes dinner was really good. And yeah. I love, uh, honestly, having some quinoa with a curry sauce and uh, some steamed veggies. I've even been known to eat kale for breakfast. That is my breakfast. So I make a kale spinach smoothie for breakfast. Uh -huh. And, and um, it's typically uh, kale, spinach, um, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, apples, all organic, oranges. Yeah. Chia seed, flax seed. Um, I was putting sunflower seed in there. My wife asked me to never do that again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's at least one more seed in there. Um, yeah. and, and just as many colors of the rainbow as I can possibly stuff into this with as much greens oh. as I can, blend it on high to get it smooth. And I feel yeah. like I've tapped on, uh, topped off the tank in the morning for nutrition. That's so good. Good for you. You know, and everyone finds what works for us. Some people like to do intermittent fasting and they don't eat till noon. Other people like to start the day with a nice solid breakfast at 7 a.m. So you got to listen to your body and see what works for you. Uh, some people do really well with green smoothies in the morning. Other people don't like to eat stuff that's blended because it goes in too fast and gets metabolized too quickly. You are the only expert on the planet on you. You are the only you there is. And just because tons of studies tell us that most people most of the time do better with one food group or another group doesn't mean it's true for you, which is why one of the chapters in 31 Day Food Revolution looks at how to know what's right for you so you can really make the choices that are intelligent for your body. Thank you. And I found it's even seasonal. You may like one thing at one time, not at another. For my smell, yes. myself, summer, I would never go with a uh, this sounds revolting, but it's actually good in a cold winter time. A warm or room temperature green smoothie. You might want it cooler, but this time yeah. of year, not at all. So I'm going to talk about one of my favorites, and it's interesting. I pour out Jessica's smoothie. She's my wife and the producer. I pour out her first, and then I go after some cacao nibs and throw mm -hmm. them in for myself. Tell us about yeah. chocolate. Oh, chocolate and coffee are two of uh, the real superfoods that have been unfairly maligned. Mm -hmm. So uh, chocolate is um, good for your heart. It's good for your brain. It's good for your mood. Uh, it has compounds in it that actually, there's a reason why we eat 58 million pounds of chocolate on Valentine's week in America. It's, uh, it's, well, yes, it's mixed with a lot of sugar, but it's also associated with love for a very good reason. Uh, because it actually does tend to help evoke feelings of love and connection and positive vibes. Um, the challenge is, of course, when we produce it with child labor, there's 1.5 million kids right now that are essentially enslaved in the chocolate industry in Ghana and the Ivory Coast. 60% um, of the world's chocolate comes from over there. So um, you don't want to participate in that. And I say go organic or fair trade, because that means it won't be coming from those parts of the world. And um, and then um, 
the other thing is when it's full of sugar and a lot of uh, milk fat, then that's not your friend. But uh, dark chocolate, say 70% or more cacao, uh, that's fair trade and organic, I don't have any problem with that. I think that is a superfood. Woohoo! So let's whip through a few things real quickly, then we're going to let you get going here today. First off, alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol is not your friend. I mean, there are, there are no studies that link alcohol consumption with health benefits, although I will say that social connection is good for you, and some people find that it's a lubricant that helps them connect more easily with other people. But uh, generally, if you can find other ways of opening your heart and building bonding and trust and connection with loved ones, that's going to be better for you because alcohol is bad for your cells. It promotes cancer and promotes heart disease as well. Um, and um, if you are going to consume alcohol, then the least unhealthy form, let me say, is red wine. Because then along with the alcohol, you're getting some good stuff, which is resveratrol. It's what makes the red grapes red yeah. and are, are part of it. And resveratrol has some wonderful health effects, including anti-cancer effects. And it's one of the reasons why, statistically, people who drink red wine in many parts of the world tend to live longer and healthier lives. But I don't think it's just because of the alcohol in there. I think it's actually in spite of it. I think that they're getting resveratrol. And you can also get that from red grape juice, by the way. So I'm generally not a fan of fruit juice, but red grape juice is the exception because resveratrol is so wonderful. However, the best thing of all is to eat red grapes. Now, I lived in France for a few years, and we would, we would have red wine at dinner. But it wasn't, to me, the health benefit of the red wine specifically. It's that you were taking three hours to right. pause, enjoy a meal, take your yes. time. So it's a lifestyle thing. In fact, let's go from here. Let's talk real briefly about feeding our children well, where we begin, and what's wrong with American school lunches. Oh, don't get me started on that, Michael. I got you All started. Right. So we want to feed our children well because they're the next generation, right? And I think we, all of us who are informed, all of us who are learning about food have some kind of moral responsibility to nurture our children well and to stand up to a toxic food culture that is exploiting them, industries that are exploiting them for their profits at the expense of our children's future. So for those of us who know, for those of us who are informed, we want to help, right? So how do you help nurture good eating habits in kids? Whether you have kids or not, there are some tips. I have a whole chapter on this in 31 Day Food Revolution, but you know, some of the tips, you can feed them wonderful food, you can find ways to chop up vegetables that they might like, give vegetables funny names, have vegetables, have conversations, the broccoli can chat with the celery, you know, with little kids. Uh, ants on a log is a fun one. Adding vegetables to all kinds of things is a fun one. Having vegetables out on the table before a meal. Our kids used to get hungry while we're prepping dinner and they're rummaging through the cupboards and getting snacky and grabbing whatever they can find. So what we started doing was we would put chopped veggies and hummus or something out on the table, and while we're making dinner, they're snacking on that. Then, then if they get full before dinner, who cares? They just filled up on broccoli, for goodness sakes, <laughs> right? Or celery sticks, no problem, you know? And uh, so that that's a wonderful tip. Um, and uh, then you can also talk to them about food a lot earlier than you might think. A lot of us, you know, don't want to... Um, you know, weigh our kids down with too much data or heavy information. That's understandable. But you know what? We live in a toxic food culture, so they're going to have to develop an immune system sooner than you might think. So leveling with them can be pretty important. I was six years old when my dad was taking me into supermarkets and reading ingredient labels to me on packages wow. and telling me what the heck those things meant. And I had a similar experience uh, when my kids were about 10. We were, um, we, we wound up, they wanted to uh, look at, what was it? It was, um, <laughs> it was uh, Doritos. Yeah. They wanted me to explain to them every item in a Doritos uh, chip. Well, that's a good and challenge. so we Googled, we go there were 40 things on there and we Googled every one of them and talked about it. And uh, my kids are on the autism spectrum. And one of the benefits of that is that they have incredible patience and stamina to follow through on something. So they literally wanted to understand every single one of those 40 ingredients and what the health risks of it were. Kids can be amazing sometimes, and it's really powerful to give them that information so that they can make informed choices. Obviously, age appropriate. You don't want to gross them out or terrify them about food, but you do want to empower them with health-giving knowledge. And then I can't, I, I can't believe I'm going to go there, but I have to. Real, real briefly, we'll whip through a few last things. America's school lunches. Okay, yeah. 
So, you know, there's been some progress with school lunches on the federal level in the last few years. Um, some of that was actually recently ruled back by the current administration. Um, but there's still, still been some positive movement. Um, however, it's still woefully inadequate. And you as a citizen can do something about it. If, if you pay taxes and you want those taxes to go towards healthy food in your community, uh, you can actually reach out to your local um, school food services director. You can actually Google it and find out what they are in Google, or you can contact your local school board and meet with the school superintendent, and you can ask them questions about what they're struggling with, what they're doing to get the kids eating more vegetables, what they're doing to bring down the sugar content, how it's going, and then you can offer resources. The, I, I share some of this in 31 Day Food Revolution in a lot more depth, but there's actually organizations out there that provide recipes that are field tested, that actually work with kids. They're kid approved and uh, they're fabulous. And so when you uh, offer those kinds of recipes to schools, then they may give them a try. And the whole art, of course, is funding. A lot of them are stuck with uh, foods that are really cheap because they are subsidized by the government. It's kind of like you're being fined for wearing your seatbelt. If you want to do the right thing, you have to pay extra. But there are ways around that, ways to work with that. And some people actually take on raising a bit of money to supplement, to make it easier so that our kids can eat real food in school. Beautiful. On that note, since we're talking about uh, subsidiaries, subsidiaries, supplementing, and cost, is organic yeah. worth the cost? Oh my, well, so here's the deal. If you're choosing between an organic donut and non-organic kale, go for the kale. There are a lot of studies showing tremendous health benefits from eating whole foods, plant-based diet with more vegetables and fruits and legumes. And most of those vegetables and fruits and legumes were grown commercially. They weren't organic and they still led to tremendous health benefit. So for those who can't afford organic, the most important thing is to eat real food, mostly plants, not too much, to quote Michael Pollan, and you'll get tremendous health benefits. And that's documented and proven. That said, we also know that organic, uh, non-organic foods, conventionally grown foods, are sprayed with neurotoxic pesticides, that many of our farm workers are dying of cancer at epidemic levels. Life expectancy for farm workers in California, and one study was reported at 49 years. So if it's killing the farm workers in the field, it's probably not good for the rest of us either. And, um, and so I think one of the reasons to go organic is to spare the farm workers that kind of suffering. Another is to spare the environment suffering. And another is to spare our bodies those pesticide residues that are going to come in from those foods. And it does cost more in the current economic system. One of the reasons is that organic certification costs a lot. We've essentially put the regulatory burden on the organic farmers. Yes. They've got to pay a bunch to have inspectors come and certify that they're doing it right. Well, the people who are spraying their food with pesticides get off scot-free. And I think it would be awesome if we switched that up so that the regulatory burden was on the people who are using the extra poisons and organic farmers didn't have to deal with that. Then suddenly the price would level out. However, in the current context, if you're like most of us, you're struggling to make ends meet and it's not easy, then I say go organic where it matters the most, which is the dirty dozen. Environmental Working Group has looked at this and they analyzed those foods that are the most pesticide contaminated and those that are the least. The short of it is some of the most contaminated are going to be apples and berries and certain other fruits. Some of the least contaminated are anything with a peel or a shell that you don't eat, whether it's mangoes, papayas, uh, watermelons, avocados. Those are all places where it, there aren't as much residue that gets you to the inside. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the two second version on GMOs. GMO does not mean God move over. A lot of people are confused on this point. It means genetically modified organism. We were promised that GMOs would give us bigger yields, more drought resistant crops, better flavor, better nutrition, and lower pesticide use. They haven't delivered any of those benefits. They've brought us crops that produce the BT toxin in every cell of the plant. So they're living pesticide factories or and or that are uh, able to withstand massive sprains of toxic herbicides without dying while the weeds do die. So now we're eating plants that are insecticide producers and herbicide receptacles. We're now eating large quantities of glyphosate, which is the number one herbicide in the world developed by Monsanto Bayer. It's an endocrine disruptor and a probable carcinogen and an antibiotic. It's not your friend. I already talked about that a little bit earlier. So GMO agriculture is uh, bringing us 
very large quantities of this herbicide, and I don't think that's good for us. And that's the number one reason that I try to steer people away from having white flour or, or, or non-organic flour is because yeah. from what I understand, it's sprayed with Roundup right before the wheat is harvested so that it, woof, it throws up its growth or whatever it does so we can get a much higher yield, and then you're eating that. Yeah, exactly. It's used as a desiccant. It dries out the crop before harvest more rapidly so they can get an extra harvest in the annual cycle, um, which is great for food production, but it's not great for human health if you're concerned about eating glyphosate. What is hashtag food revolution and where can people go to find out more? <laughs> hashtag food revolution is the official hashtag of the food revolution. And you can go to find out more by reading 31 Day Food Revolution. It's available wherever fine books are sold. Grab your copy or copies. It makes a great gift. And here's a little tip. If you want to get a friend or loved one involved who may not already be enrolled, stick a little post-it note on the front saying, I thought of you on page 61, or I thought of you on page 79, or some spot that you think they might be interested in. Your odds of them opening that book and reading at least page 61 or 79 just quintupled. Awesome, awesome. Is there a URL you want to send people to? Sure. Go to 31dayfoodrevolution.com. Again, that's 31, like the number, 31dayfoodrevolution.com. You can grab your copy there as well, and you can also get some special bonuses that are only available from Food Revolution Network. Woohoo! As I let you go here, and this has been phenomenal, I'm going to recommend everyone get 31 Day Food Revolution. Is there one place you would have people start today? Oh, my goodness. Start. Uh, look at where you are. Look at where you want to go and see how you can bridge the gap. Whatever is the weakest link in your food chain, the spot where you consistently fall down, the toxin, toxic food you know you want to get rid of, make a commitment right here and right now to make that, that weak link a strong link. Find a pathway forward and then keep moving. You know what? Apathy is the thief of destiny. So put what you're learning into action. Resolve to do something, anything that moves this revolution forward and you'll build momentum. You'll take steps and steps and more steps. And before you know it, you will be in a new place and your body will be thanking you for the rest of your life. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much, Ocean. This has been so, so much fun. I love your book. I learned a lot of stuff going through it. And I've read, obviously, Michael Greger's books and so many books more. But it's been, it is, it's nutritionally dense and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Michael. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get 31 Day Food Revolution, and begin healing your body and transforming your world today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much, Ocean. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. That was fun. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>